Hello and welcome to Health Live at Seniors today. You know, I must make a confession. The session that we are having today, we should have had much earlier. It was um, in in, a, in my discussion with uh, uh, somebody who uh, represents uh, the Wokhart Hospital, and we were looking at various areas that we have covered so far and which one we should cover, especially for senior citizens. One of the things which I do is I speak to doctors, I speak to various people to look at what are the uh, what are the things that are required by senior citizens. And um, I was asked, have you done emergency medicine? I said, well, emergency medicine, we have never, never done. We've had one uh, a physician in the past, but we've never had a, a, an emergency specialist, medicine specialist. And that's when uh, uh, she recommended uh, the name of Dr. Santosh Bansode. Dr. Santosh Bansode is the head of department of emergency medicine at Wokhart Hospitals in Mumbai. Dr. Bansode has worked in the field of emergency medicine for over two decades and has done a specialization in emergency medicine from the Royal College in London. Welcome to Health Live at Seniors Today, Dr. Bansode. Good evening, good evening. And thanks a lot for inviting me, you know, to talk to you all. Thank you very much. Uh, so, you know, we, 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 like, like in the discussion that I had with you uh, before we started this session, uh, there's a lot of ignorance about what emergency medicine entails. And, uh, you know, so uh, we were speaking to him earlier, we were speaking to the doctor earlier, and he said he wouldn't want to make a presentation. He would like to talk about uh, what needs to be done. And uh, he'll give us tips of what has to be done. And then we will open to questions after that. Those of you who have questions, please, as always, put them on the in the Q&A tab, you can also put them in the chat, but I would prefer Q&A because we can manage the questions better. And uh, uh, mention your uh, gender as well as your age. Mention your gender as well as your age and we will uh, present, to do, present them to Dr. Bansode. As uh, always, we prefer questions that are asked by people who are um, uh, senior citizens uh, uh, and uh, you know can take advantage of this. But... Um, over to you, Dr. Bansode. How, how have you been and how's the... Uh, if I might ask you a very... Uh, put it very casually and, and, and not yeah. to visualize it. But, but what's the typical traffic like at, at a... Well, emergency medicine and the emergency ward, as you told me, is the first port of call yes. for somebody entering a hospital. Yes, yes. So what is the kind of traffic like? Is there... Is there you know, are you... Are you uh, do you work 24 by 7? Is it, uh, uh, you know, do you, uh, are there days when you have more patients than the regular ones? Is there, how do you, how do you plan out uh, uh, for all of that? And, you know, and especially in a hospital like Wokhart, where you have, yeah. you are in central Mumbai and uh, uh, you have a host of people who, who would be coming there. Yes. So tell us about that. And then, and then of course, go ahead and, you know, make your uh, presentation. So Dr. Bansode is going to be talking about emergency health and em emergency care for senior citizens. Yes. Over yes. to you, Dr. Bansode. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks once again for giving me such an opportunity. Actually, emergency medicine, emergency department is totally unpredictable. You know, sometimes, you know, four or five patients come at a time, sometimes one or two patients like that, totally unpredictable. So, First thing we do is like we triage them. We triage them according to their symptoms and what they are suffering from. And then we diagnose the, what is the cause of their suffering. And we give them optimal management here only in emergency department. And, and then we shift them to either ICU or ward depending upon their uh, condition at that time. So this is how we work. And our job is really hectic because all types of patients, including uh, like cardiac emergencies, emergency related to, you know, brain or all types of like uh, accidents, every, everything comes in emergency department only uh, initially. Then we are, we are the one who manage them initially and then we uh, shift them accordingly. You know, if some patient needs emergent, uh, urgent surgery, then we shift them directly to OT. If someone needs uh, urgent angioplasty, angiography, we shift them directly to cath lab. Like that we manage, you know, we are always on our, you know, toes. We are running here and there. This is a very happening department, emergency medicine. So uh, today, uh, like we'll speak on the most common things, you know, that can happen at home and uh, where 
where most of the people get panic you know at home and then they don't know what to do in such situations so i'll just brief you on you know cardiac emergencies and uh, brain related emergencies and uh, after that uh, you can ask me any questions about any emergency and i'll i'll try and explain you everything regarding that so first of all we'll see about you know most common thing is a, a chest pain because see like uh, it is the most common thing and most worrying thing like whenever we get chest pain the first thing we get stressed whether it's a cardiac related or whether it's a non cardiac we really don't know what's happening with us because chest pain is the one thing that we heard from many thing many people that uh, such and such person got heart attack and you know he expired uh, immediately on the spot so that that are the things which are going back of our mind so we are always you know worried whenever we get chest pain so i'll tell you in simple language how to differentiate a cardiac and non cardiac chest pain so that is very very important so at the night suppose someone get chest pain so how can we differentiate on his own without taking any ecg okay so first of all we have to ask ourselves like where the chest pain exactly can we point out the chest pain suppose for example we can point out the chest pain like i have chest pain here or here if you can point out with one finger then generally it is a non cardiac type of chest pain okay so how the cardiac type of chest pain occurs see cardiac type of chest pain is such a chest pain which will make us very uneasy we will feel like you know some heavy weight is put on our chest we will feel like we are choking there is choking sensation it will be always you know associated with profuse sweating breathlessness or sometimes vomiting also so it is a kind of chest pain which will make us uneasy and we we cannot you know be at home uh, you know uh, with that kind of chest pain so this is generally a cardiac thing so we have to rush to the hospital and take our ecg as early as possible and on contrast the non cardiac chest pain will be you know we can point out where the chest pain is it will be a stable kind of chest pain and it will vanish also in after say a few minutes or something like that and you won't you will be always comfortable with that kind of chest pain so this is generally a non cardiac type of chest pain so what happens you know once we get this uh, chest pain with all other symptoms and we we have we have a doubt whether it's a cardiac or non cardiac so what can we do at that time suppose we are in doubt so first thing is see whether we can reach any hospital to take ecg and if we we have some time with us then always keep one tablet dispirin with us so you can simply dissolve that tablet in a in a glass of water and drink that so dispirin has proven a very helpful in dislodging the initial stage of the clot it is a blood thinner and it acts very fast so it can be life saving sometimes i have seen one or two experiences with my you know own colleagues that uh, they had kind of chest pain and they have taken a dispirin and then their life has been saved because it it always take time time to reach the hospital you know in that case that dispirin will be very very helpful so that is about the chest pain so another emergency we generally occur is a stroke like a thing like a brain emergency so what i mean what we have to remember in a, a brain emergency one synonym which we called as a fast fast so how to recognize a stroke at home without doing any test so fast is f stands for any facial deviation or facial asymmetry we can you know identify it looking at looking in a mirror also then a stands for any limb weakness arm weakness leg weakness any limb limb weakness s is for speech difficulty and t is for time because time is very very important in case of stroke because if we reach in hospital within 4 and 1/2 hours of onset of symptom and we get a proper treatment that is thrombolysis that is a drug which dissolve the clot then all the you know all these uh, symptoms what we have at that time can be reversed back and we can be normal as as if there was no stroke only so this time is very very important as far as stroke is concerned so whenever we have such symptoms then we have to note the time when it started but suppose any anyone goes for sleep and he wakes up with such deformity 
then he need to remember or his relatives we should ask when he was last normal or when he went to sleep or was he was he gone to toilet in in the night and at that time how he was so that time we have to consider as the onset of the time and the treatment changes accordingly so that is most important in that and in, in stroke cases never take any medicine before doing any scan of the brain because there are two types of strokes one is caused because of the clot another one is because of the hemorrhage like in cardiac we can blindly take dispirin but in stroke never take any dispirin or never any medicine without doing imaging of your brain because if if the stroke is because of the bleed and if we take dispirin or something like that then the bleed can increase and our problem can be more severe so in stroke if you have any symptoms something like that then you rush to the hospital within 4 and 1/2 hours okay and for diabetic patients the diabetic always most of the time you know hypoglycemia mimics like a stroke so immediately check sugar keep a glucometer at home immediately check check sugar and if you have low sugar try if you can eat or drink anything at that time drink a glucose water and see and then you can rush to the hospital so that you can do at home in case of the stroke and in cardiac cases other thing is you know in uh, like uh, our uh, old generation or old people the most common is you know falls so if unfortunately anyone fall at home and he get pain or some area pain like a hip pain it can be or knee pain or whatever area pain make sure that they do minimal movement you know you have to call for the help and carry them like that to the hospital because minimal movement is important because while doing movement a small fracture can become a big fracture so that care we have to take in cases of falls so these are the these are the these were the major you know things which can you know uh, trouble anyone at home and then we have to keep in mind those points which i told you other thing are like simple fever loose motion or vomiting most of the people know what to do initially like for fevers many people take crocin you know for loose motion like tablet like uh, lomotilol or uh, uh, econom sachets uh, many people can take so for that reason that are you know that can be you know managed uh, initially at home without any much tension but this few things like a cardiac thing stroke thing and fall thing these are the major things that we have to be very very careful uh, you know when we uh, you know unfortunately we face such things in our life so that's all about the, this thing then now you can ask me any questions about any emergency or any doubt you have how to manage something at home then i'll you know guide you properly in that case thank you doctor uh, i uh, i'm going to ask you a question which you know which also uh, interested me because a lot of our senior citizens are also in a sense um while they have caregivers you know for senior citizens but they are also caretakers like uh, for instance okay. you know they may have a, a grandchild at home or a great grandchild or whatever and they are also mm-hmm. taking care of of uh, of people around them also yes, what yes. happens is that they might see somebody else uh, in in their housing complexes or resident uh, uh, resident complexes who might be yes. who might be ill etc so mm-hmm. what do they do first of all for 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 a child what do they do if they have an issue i know we are talking about senior citizens but yeah yeah senior citizens i just take yeah. care of sure sure i just briefly guide you like in children you know generally children's immunity are is considered to be a good but the most common thing what worries parents is a febrile convulsions when the when the child is having fever and uh, the child starts convulsing then everybody gets panic at home so at that time first thing that our senior citizen if he is there like or he or she is there and he is seeing a child who is convulsing first thing is remove the child's clothes remove the child's clothes and fully wipe his body with a wet towel okay because because the f- most common cause of convulsion is febrile convulsion in in children the moment you wipe his body with a wet towel immediately the convulsion will stop make the child on one side and wipe his body with a wet towel that you can do 
easily at home and if suppose the child has always keep the child's file with you whenever the child goes to a pediatrician keep a file with you and then mention it is mentioned on that file also ki whenever child has fever give this and this medicine if he has any rhinitis or cough give this and this medicine so always keep that records so meanwhile somebody is wiping out the child just tell someone to take out that file and then just see which medicine is doctor has advised for the fever and what is the dose and give that dose safely to the to the child that we can do in case of children for example and another thing is like uh, children put uh, something objects or some uh, foreign bodies in their mouth they have a bad habit while playing uh, like any object and in that case suppose the child is small and you can carry the child in your hands like this then one thing you can do is you can make the child prone and then pat on his chest like this so that the uh, foreign body can be you know taken out with this patting thing and if you can op- open his mouth and see the foreign body if it is easily removable then you remove but otherwise if you have any doubt don't try to remove any foreign body because another thing can happen that it can go further in with our efforts so in that case keep patting the back and take child to the nearest pediatrician that they can do that is the most common emergency you know in children which we which we can manage at home right thank you doctor we have a few questions that have come in yes I've got one question by <clears throat> i think via facebook uh, which is uh, i am a 66 year old and had a hand dislocation in january mm-hmm. what should be done in the case of bone dislocation due to a fall what's the initial treatment offered to the person the first and foremost whenever you fall as i told uh, earlier try to do minimal movements at that time okay to ask for help if somebody is there to carry you ask for help try to do minimum movement okay and then when you you have got a, in a comfortable position then you uh, take some analgesics which are commonly available at home if you don't have any analgesic you can safely take 1 gram of crocin which is a very safe medicine and a good analgesic if you can take 1 gram so generally our tablet crocin comes in 500 mg 500 mg so you can you can read on that uh, tablet ki how many milligrams are there in one tablet so if it is there written 500 mg then you can safely take two tablet one gram of crocin orally you can take that will that will relieve your pain and when dislocation is there uh, if you find the movement you can't do of that particular joint don't try to move it and simple thing what you can note is uh, if in that case you will find out that certain way for example there is a shoulder dislocation then you will find that you can easily adduct the shoulder you can easily take the shoulder inside but you cannot take the shoulder outside you will get pain so you realize which movement is causing me more pain so don't do that movement and which movement is easing your pain you can safely keep your hand in that position so for shoulder particularly for shoulder i'll tell you this position this position you might have seen in many the fracture patients they apply the slab and they keep in this position so this is the most safe position for sh- any shoulder injury because in this position all the muscles are mostly relaxed and there are less chance of you know any fracture getting you know more worse so this position is very good so what you can do if you don't have anything at home you can take a uh, you can take our curtain or any you know towel or something like that and you can just tie tie up like this like this in this condition or you can take a simple bandage if it is available tie it at your neck and just sling your forearm like this and then you can safely go to the hospital that you think that you can do in case of there are some patient who get habitual dislocations also frequent dislocations also in that case also we don't recommend you know to relocate or try to relocate your joint at home because in at trying to relocate your joint you might fracture that bone because in uh, you know when as our age age goes up our bones become more and more brittle so we have to be very careful in this condition so try to keep your arm or whatever part in a position where the pain will be least just observe yourself how how the, my pain will be least like this i am doing oh it is least like this it is increasing so do like this and then you can go to the hospital 
and there also after reaching hospital they will do your x ray first and then only they will try to relocate your joint we have a question from uh, uh, mr shankar chavan who asks uh, uh, mr shankar chavan is 82 year old he asks what about sorbitrate pills you mentioned about disprin being uh, you know one should always have a disprin uh, yes. uh, with her or him but yeah. what about sorbitrate which was typically always uh, uh, you know given as an mm. sos and one must always keep it yeah so in a in a patient who is a known case of cardiac disease okay so in in those patients you know you can take uh, sorbitrate and then go to the hospital but once uh, the one thing about sorbitrate we have to keep in mind is that sorbitrate reduces your blood pressure so in that case suppose uh, in some some kinds of heart problem like inferior wall cardiac uh, problems our bp already goes down and in those condition if you take blindly sorbitrate without checking our blood pressure then it might you know make our problem worse so if if a person is a known cardiac and he has taken sorbitrate before also he can safely take sorbitrate but the person who has never taken sorbitrate you avoid it at the first thing you can take dispirin and go to the hospital that will be the safest thing for you and doctor what are the kind of gadgets one must have in the house for See, instance you mentioned about having a glucometer yeah uh, you know what are the other meters one must have yeah so you can you can now with this we get we get digital you know blood pressure machines which we, we get that is also helpful in uh, emergencies then you you can buy that uh, pulse oximeter which will show your oxygen level and pulse rate at that time that is also hel- helpful so pulse oximeter one digital uh, bp measure machine measuring machine these are more than enough and along with the glucometer these are more than enough at home the digital uh, because, uh, blood pressure machine also measures the pulse so you can is that enough to have yeah you can rely but in pulse oximeter nowadays you know covid is the most common thing so we are always worried about our oxygen level so pulse oximeter will be very handy in that case suppose if if we have we have fever cough or rhinitis or any other kinds of symptoms you know and then we get worried ki what is our you know actual situation are we serious or are we normal so if you see the normal pulse oximeter then you can be relax you know relaxly go to the hospital so pulse oximeter is very handy and it is very cheap also you can easily buy it i i know we don't like to recommend uh, 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 specific brands but because you know there are just so many of them available and so many of them are available on uh, the various e-commerce sites would you recommend any specific uh, brand that you know one could look at uh, yeah i is something I, I, that we should yeah. look at look out for or or look out for that you know well more than the do's the don'ts are there some specific type of machine that you should not ever buy see what you do you know you when you buy a pulse oximeter or you if you have any pulse oximeter you apply it to all your fingers and check it whether how much is the difference it is showing in each finger like oxygen level or something if the difference is minimal in each fingers then it is a good pulse oximeter you can rely on it but suppose the difference is huge and one finger it is showing 96 another finger it is showing some 85 or 88 something like that so you cannot rely on that so you test yourself with your machine that and is a good for how long should one keep it uh, should one keep the finger in in it see whenever you keep a finger in the pulse oximeter you observe the wave forms first of all when initially you will see a like a straight line you will see but then soon there there will be a wave form once the complete wave form you see at that time you record your readings so that is the ideal time and then you can remove it so it's not necessarily a one minute that you must uh... no no it is not necessary you observe the wave form the wave form suggests that our you know our pulse and our perf- perfusion of the finger is getting calculated properly you see the proper waves are coming you note that till that time you wait once you see the proper waves are coming and then you record your uh, reading that will be the ideal thing and uh, the blood pressure machine you mentioned about uh, you know when you have the regular spigomanometers which are uh, where you need also a stethoscope 
Yeah. But these uh, automated machines that you have, digital, are they are they reliable? They are reliable, but they show uh, some ten or twenty degrees higher BP sometimes. Okay, but that is fine because you get a rough idea with that. Okay, you yeah. there the digital ten to twenty degree. 10 to 20 yeah. is a significant uh, amount. For instance, the this glucometer, the glucometer I have seen for yeah. myself, the glucometer reading is always some 10 Higher. times more than the yeah. regular. See, glucometers will always show you 20% higher than your venous sugar. You know, because glucometer calculates the sugar in your capillaries. Okay. The capillary sugar are the arterial sugar. That is arterial means the from the heart, the blood goes to the tissues. Okay, but that blood is arterial blood, what we call as. And when we give sample in labs, we give venous blood. That is a more accurate sugar. So arterial sugar, when it goes to the tissues, it delivers sugar to the tissues. That's why venous sugar is always less than the arterial sugar. And our glucometer, it calculates the arterial sugar, the capillary sugar. That's why it is always twenty percent higher than our venous sugar, sir. No, I must tell you, this is the first time I have heard this. I have read a fair bit. But I wasn't yeah. such an easy and simple. Yes. yes. So what, because, about the, what about the blood pressure machine? Which one should one buy? Are these reliable? See what you do. Simple thing is whatever machine you have. Okay. You just check the blood, and once you counter check with the some doctor or nurse or you know paramedics, what is the difference in between your machine calc machine uh, BP and the manual BP? If difference of Difference of ten or twenty we consider as a normal difference because because our BP changes every minute also. While I am talking, my BP goes little high. When I am not talking, BP goes little low. So it is always you know changing. That's why you know when we see first time any patient with a blood pressure which is more, we don't immediately start him on a uh, any antihypertensive unless an anti unless he has some symptoms. If he don't have symptoms. We measure his BP at least a twice a week for three weeks, and if persistently we get high readings, then only we start the BP medicine on him. So, like that, ten or twenty. If you see any difference, you can rely on that machine, sir. But uh, <clears throat> well, the thing is that today most doctors also use the automated machines. Yes. Right. They have those machines which are there because it's it's faster. Yeah. So you 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 would say that one should check it only with a doctor. See, Yeah, the- before before starting any medicine or adjusting the current medicine, we have to check BP manually always. We have to check always manually, and then only you change the correction. Because you know, once the once we fix the dose, our patient takes it for prolong. You know, prolong that medicine which goes lifelong. So we cannot you know just see on monitor and and adjust the dose or start new medicine. So for that reason, we always. Check BP manually before doing this, before starting the medicine or changing the dose. One last question on this. I know we've gone on. No, no, no problem. You can ask as many as I know. Nothing. You know. So, what kind of machine would you recommend for the blood pressure checking? Is there a specific kind of med- machine that you should look at, or there are several which are available in the market? Yeah, there are many brands available in market. You can, you know, just uh, re- read the reviews of uh, before buying. And once you buy anything or you go to buy that machine, you just counter check with your manual findings, and then you decide like whether it's a reliable or no. All right, thank you, doctor. And what about the ECG machine? Would you recommend to buy an ECG machine? No, no, no. don't buy. buy the... No, no, no. You don't buy ECG machines because you know uh, ECG. Interpretation is, you know, something different, and the machines will give you wrong readings and wrong reports, and then you will unnecessarily get panic because you know some ECG machines they have their own data with them, and even a slight deviation of wave, they give report as a myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack, and which is not the case actually, because uh, once we see, we have our own standard when we see with our eyes, then only we diagnose the ECG. We don't rely on the uh you know machine report so don't buy ever ecg machines and uh, doing ecgs uh like uh, routinely is also not a good idea do ecg only when you have symptoms or you have doubts uh, like see, uh, like uh, pronounced doubt like then only do ecg otherwise avoid ecgs and even you know some uh, some watches now come like this apple watch they advertise it like it has a ecg 
but this is a totally non reliable ecg even if you see the report on that watch it they clearly mention that our apple watch or our so and so watch don't it diagnose heart attacks they only see whether the patient has atrial fibrillation which is a one type of arrhythmia whether the patient has atrial fibrillation or no that's it they don't diagnose anything so don't rely on that uh, watch or any other ecg machine right thank you very much thank you for your very detailed and crystal clear uh, explanation we yes. have a question that has come in if the person is a cardiac patient and not able to breathe can cpr be the first course of treatment at home no 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 if the patient is awake see cpr is given only when the patient don't have pulse central pulse the patient don't have pulse and patient is collapsed completely his heart is stopped then only cpr is given cpr is not given if the patient has pulse so make make sure that if you see any patient collapse first you see how alert he is by tapping his both shoulders why both shoulders because you know it might happen that something happened in his brain and his one shoulder has less sensation so always tap both the shoulders and ask him what's happened to you are you okay suppose he is not responding the next thing you do is call for help tell somebody to call doctor or ambulance and then you come to that patient and check for his central pulse so central pulse is this adam's apple you know you have to palpate this adam's apple and just go at a side there is a groove there is a groove in which you can easily palpate your carotid pulse just see whether it is there or no if it is not there then you start pumping his you know heart and i will suggest that uh, to all see, through your uh, you know organization you can arrange a basic life support course for all our senior citizen that will that will be very very helpful you know in saving somebody's life it is a course that anyone can do you know a non medico can do and he can save the life it is a one day course i will suggest all you know to arrange that course for our senior citizens i will be happy to do it but it has to be done in person right it has to be be done yeah it has to be done in person and we can do in batches also right we we will you know i will i will speak with you and uh, figure out because we have our uh, uh, you know people who are here are from across the country so yes. we need to look at um, how we can do it but Sure, sure. Ah, that was just a suggestion, sir. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a question from um, uh, Vimla Ved. She says, "My husband got a stroke, so took him to the doctor, but within one hour, within one hour, but yet his right side is weaker." See, uh, they must. I think they have. They reached the hospital in time. That's the best thing they have done. They have reached the hospital in time. and hospital must have given them that thrombolytic treatment that is a drug which we give and to uh, you know dissolve the clot so that the patient can be reverted to normal thing but in stroke cases you know there are almost 30% of patients are there whose full symptoms do not revert back to normal because brain tissue is naturally made in such a way that once damaged cells of the brain they never regenerate so how the stroke patient improves after some time you know the power improves it happens because the other tissues that take work of that damaged tissue and then the slowly you know the patient who is not able to walk initially then slowly after few months he can start walking you know you see the improvement in stroke patient in uh, in such a way because the other tissues that they, they take function of that damaged tissue so in madam's ka uh, madam's uh, relatives condition that must have happened that tissue might have got damage which will which will not regenerate because and when the other tissue will take function of that tissue his uh, symptoms might improve after some time so you have to keep giving a physiotherapy you have to continue taking a blood thinner medicine for him right um doctor we have quite a few questions that have come in so i'm going to ask them very quickly uh uh doctor please do repeat the two types of strokes there are two types of stroke one happens because of the clot that is we call as a ischemic stroke in which the clot happens and because of the clot the blood cannot go and reach to the brain that is a ischemic stroke and another stroke is because of the blood that the blood vessel in the brain that bursts 
and the, there is a hemorrhage in the brain that is a blood blood the spill in the brain so that is a hemorrhagic stroke so we are having two types of stroke one is ischemic stroke one is hemorrhagic stroke and the treatment totally differ from each other so that's why we always say don't give any medicine in case you suspect any stroke without doing any imaging uh doctor we have two questions one from colonel dukal and the other from mr ashok grover uh what are the safe and ideal levels of bp for senior citizens uh mr grover has said of above 65 years and older see ideal level of bp is 120 systolic and 80 diastolic okay but nobody has ideal level because bp is always changing as we move as we do our activities okay so once our we are on medicine okay once our first thing we'll see if we are not on medicine okay once we are not on medicine then 140 systolic and 90 diastolic is called as a borderline bp okay once bp increases above 140 in systolic that is upper bp and above 90 in diastolic and if if it is persistent for more than 3 weeks then we start medicine okay that is when we are not on any medicine so now if someone is on medicine someone is on medicine and then we have to see what other condition that patient is having suppose the patient is having a condition of stroke in the past or patient is a known case of stroke then little higher bp is good for him like 150 90 is also good for him if he is on medicine and he has a stroke in pass so that depend upon the patient's condition but 140 90 we calculate as a borderline bp and if patient is on medicine then if, even if the patient's bp is 140 90 it is a normal for him if someone is getting symptom of symptom any symptom at any bp like suppose any patient has a bp 140 90 if he is getting symptom like headache uneasiness then we have to bring it down but if patient is comfortable at 140 90 it is fine for us so it all depends upon person to person but 140 90 is cut off right uh, doctor we have a question from kt dadanji who says i am 70 year old woman and i want to know is it okay to take shellcal ct 500 and apraise d3 daily or should you give a break also she has mentioned you mentioned taking lomotil but we were told that we should not take this tablet hence please suggest another tablet in its place yeah so you can for first of all i'll speak about uh, apraise d and calcium so calcium you can take daily but apraise d is a vitamin d3 that course you can do once a week for 8 weeks every year you can do so like once a week for 8 weeks means two months you will take once a week that uh, apraise d and then you can safely take a break from that and next year you repeat that and you can carry on like that and if you have any doubt in between you just check your vitamin d3 and calcium level whether our this management is going good or no you will come to know and then you can make a changes accordingly some in some part of the world this lomotil is banned because it causes relaxation of the intestine and they say that because of the relaxation of the intestine the stool may get stagnant there and they may have some other infection intestinal infection in some, some part it is bad so you can take safely lactic acid basilate that is econom sachet that is a natural source of our natural normal bacteria that you can take safely so econom sachet you can keep at home you can take almost you can take even three times a day also in case of loose motion that is most safe medicine right thank you we have a question from aban dhondi who says doctor why does my bp show higher value when i am at the doctor's office yeah that is a, that is we call as a white collar blood pressure so bp you know bp is a very complex thing you know bp is very complex thing. so if as if like suppose we get anger our bp increases when we sleep our bp decreases so similar type if i have some exam i go for the exam my bp will increase so similarly we call it as a white collar bp whenever the patient go to the doctor he becomes anxious and his bp raises so that is a quite normal bp we no need to worry at all for that kind of bp uh, we have a question from hema nayak who asks uh, doctor can you suggest a bp machine for kids below 10 years see don't i my personal suggestion is 
don't measure bp of kids below 10 years unless and until it's a you know some kind of disease the child inherited disease something he is having so don't take care, don't measure if the child is healthy but if in case the child is having some cardiac illness or something like genetic illness then you can take any any machine with a pediatric cuff they you ask that uh, you know uh, you ask them whether that has a pediatric cuff in that so that machine you can take right we have two more questions dr we'll ask uh, one is from zareen shof why do i get nose bleeds intermittently especially after a deep headache see nose bleed is uh, again there are various factor which cause a nose bleed the most common is a dry mucosa of your nose okay suppose you are prolongedly sitting in ac or cold environment and your mucosa becomes dry so is the most common uh, you most common cause of the nose bleed another thing is whenever you get your nose bleed you check your blood pressure suppose it is higher on higher side then the cause is different that is it, is it is because of your increased bp so but whatever reasons you have nose bleed you do one thing at that time is you just lie down supine lie down supine on your back and keep some some ice pack on your this part the nose part you can keep some ice pack there and then your nose bleed will stop another thing you can do is to pinch your nose for 3 to 5 minutes and th- that will also help in stopping your nose bleed so if you have nose bleed if your bp is normal then it is because of the dry mucosa nothing to worry about it right thank you and we have one last question from uh, a regular attendee uh, that is by mr gurdeep straw he wants to know about appendicitis he is uh, male 65 okay so whenever we get abdominal pain that to right side on the lower part of the abdomen we call it as a iliac fossa region at that time whenever we get a pain and that pain will be very severe pain okay so then there are two diagnosis in that one is a renal colic that is a pain because of the stone and another one is a appendicitis so appendicitis is diagnosed on uh, diagnose only after the examination of that part so what we do in our examination we find out a point which we call as a macburney's point there and we press it on that and we just see for the rebound tenderness so when we press it and patient gets severe pain that we call as a rebound tenderness so that is generally appendicitis and how to differentiate from uh, renal colic is we, is we hit the patient on renal angle there is a one angle we find out that that is the kidney angle and when when we hit it and the pain increases that is because of the renal stone so i suggest whenever you have right iliac fossa region pain you just go to your nearby doctor and get yourself checked on examination only he will come to know which type of pain it is and then he will guide you accordingly thank you very much uh, dr bansode for uh, your uh, time and for your advice all very clear clearly given and as i mentioned i wish i had we had done a session with uh, with you much earlier uh, so thank you very much for your time and thank you everyone here uh, and thanks a lot I, sir I for coming to, to to stay on for a minute there are yeah. a few uh, uh, few announcements that i would like to make one of course is that we will be back uh, uh, next saturday at 5 pm for a next session of uh, health live at seniors today the second thing is uh, uh, those of you who aren't aware the september 15th issue of seniors today is 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 now out it is downloadable and accessible at uh, seniorstoday.in i would request you to uh, take a look at it and i'll in the next minute or so uh, we'll just play a one minute av on that and uh, the third thing is that uh, the season 5 and, and doctor you must hear this season 5 of seniors have talent is starting tomorrow oh very and nice seniors have talent has senior citizens above the age of 60 oh, i remember nice. right there were two people over here who are participating tomorrow in tomorrow's oh. session one is uh, i see a former participant a former winner also here uh, 
Nandini Jambekar and uh, uh, there was somebody else who was there here earlier. Uh, Madhuraji was here. So they are participating. It's a, it's a fantastic thing. We've had four seasons. Very four nice. And we've had over 400, nearly 500 uh, oh. participants from across the country. Very nice. Very who are nice. there and who are really enjoying themselves. Wow. And, you know, as a doctor, you'll, you'll appreciate that it is also very therapeutic. Yeah, that's yeah it's true. therapeutic. Correct. That's true. <laughs> you are that's absolutely true. right. Uh, so that's how it is. And we are, uh, 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 once again, uh, Dr. Bansode, thank you for being here. Yeah, I'm I, also thankful to you. I felt very nice after talking to you all. And you have conducted it very nicely. I was very comfortable. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. I'll better sort of check uh, if our producer has the video. Uh, yes, so you can have a look at what we have in the new issue of uh, Senior Today. Okay. okay. Subscribe now and press the bell icon. Never miss an update. Amitabh Bachchan uh, will get into his 80th year on October yeah. 11. Yes. 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 Advanced, uh, thing. His top films, his uh, hemoglobin in the atmosphere, his uh, take off in the storm, oh. and his ad. Good, good, good. This is an artistic guy, a widow donor, a doctor. Okay, Even okay. You make it on the river, it's a fantastic Oh, wow, it's looking there. really nice, huh? Fitness celebrations and uh, uh, an article on the quintessential Gujarati. So, wow. This is the latest issue of the book, right? And uh, as very, nice. Here, very nice. Thank you very much. And as you yeah. all know, it is available um, uh, free of cost. It is at no cost. Okay. You can access it uh, while visiting seniors today, uh, dot in. We will. Oh. Uh, we will send you the link. I'm just putting the link as I'm right as I'm speaking, which is the seniors today uh, link on the on mm. the website. You can also subscribe to our newsletters, and I must tell you something that you can actually match your uh, time with it because it is the newsletter comes every morning, Monday oh. to Saturday at six thirty. Okay. okay. We have a newsletter where we. Update three to three to four three articles every day, wow. um, and uh, most of them are health has articles. Most of them wow. are lifestyle. We also do uh, we also do diet, and wow. uh, and and again I must tell you so seniors have talent starts tomorrow. That is the fifth season. Those of you who have friends and family who would like to participate, uh, please spread the word. It is once again entry is free of cost. Uh, and there are prizes to be won, and it's a very democratic process that we have for um, uh, for the prize winners also. And we also have something called Seniors Kitchen, which is the okay. Seniors Kitchen, where you have uh, recipes. And uh, I must tell you that I've I'm, I've tried one chicken ka achar and one karele ka achar, <laughs> karele ka something. I, I don't like <laughs> karele, but you know this one was was particularly interesting. So, very <laughs> nice. Taken, sorry to have taken two minutes of yours again. No, no, I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed it. Very nice. Very nice initiative, sir. Thank you. Excellent. And, uh, Namaskar and uh, see you again next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you.